Hi, welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today we begin a five-week series of contemporary Italian films. We'll be seeing two films by Bernardo Bertolucci, two films by Marco Bolocchio, and a final film by the Taviani brothers. Today we begin with the 1964 production before the Revolution, directed by Bernardo Bertolucci. The film is formally innovative, and it is a marvelous account of a young man struggling to come of age, to come to terms with his politics, and with his family. After the film, we have, as usual, two guests to discuss those matters and others. Today's guests are Professor Pellegrino de Cerno of Hofstra University and Professor Robert Kolker of the University of Maryland. But now, enjoy Before the Revolution. Uh, she'll never come back. It's one of those things. Um, where, uh, hi. Welcome back to Cinema Then, Cinema Now. I hope you enjoyed Bernardo Bertolucci's Before the Revolution, uh, what we think is a rare treat to be able to see on television and one of the remarkable films from this period of early 60s European filmmaking. Uh, I have the pleasure of always of having two guests with me and I'd like to take this moment to introduce them to you before we launch into a lot of things I think that can be said about this uh, wonderful film. Uh, to my left I have the pleasure of having my uh, a friend Pellegrino de Cerno, who is a professor of uh, comparative literature at Hofstra University. Pelle has also done uh, extensive teaching at Columbia. He's right now a visiting professor at uh, New York University as well. Pelle these days has the, um, I think, rather remarkable distinction of having six books in some stage of being in press or in preparation. One of those that will be coming out uh, very soon is a study of the Italian futurist Marinetti, and that will be coming in the Scribner's Writers series. Uh, his considerable interest in cinema will soon will soon be focused into uh, another book, which will be titled "Strange Loops: Visual and Textual Strategies in the Modernist uh, Cinema." Uh, to my right, I have the pleasure of having today uh, uh, Professor Robert Kolker, who hails from the University of Maryland, where he is the professor of film studies in the division of radio, television, and film. Bob's written uh, three books on the cinema, uh, The Cinema of Loneliness, which is a study of contemporary American filmmaking, a second edition of which will be out in the spring of 1988, uh, uh, The Altering Eye, which is a study of contemporary European and uh, Latin American styles of filmmaking, and uh, suspiciously enough, uh, he also seems to have written a book called Bernardo Bertolucci, um, and I think since we've got the guy who wrote the book on Bernardo Bertolucci here, it might be good, Bob, to uh, start with who Bertolucci is. I think many people in our audience, if they know the name, certainly know the name as connected with Last Tango in Paris, uh, extremely famous, indeed infamous film in, uh, in some circles. Why don't we begin with who is this guy anyway, and where does Before the Revolution fit into his growth and development. Bertolucci is the son of a poet, okay. uh, born in Parma, uh, got into cinema relatively early in his career, in the, uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, through the help of Per Paolo Pasolini. In fact, he was an assistant for Pasolini uh, for a while, and Pasolini gave him, as a kind of gift, a script 
for uh, Bertolucci's first film, La Camada Seca. And how's that translate? Uh, it's really not translatable. It's something roughly like the withered old hag. Okay. The usual English translation is the Grim Reaper, which really doesn't uh, do have much to do with the film. It's a very curious film. It's not a very wonderful film. It's yeah. a very curious film full of experimenting with points of view and narrative and, and flashbacks and telling this, a story from a variety of different ways. It's sort of a, an intellectual Italian adolescence version of Rashomon via Citizen Kane okay. uh, yeah. done through um, working class Italians. <laughs> Uh, Before the Revolution is his second feature, and this is really the film in which he begins to collect himself, as it were. The 60s, the early 60s, are an enormously active period in, in international filmmaking, a, a moment in which the term film culture really has some meaning, in which everybody, all intellectuals, are thinking about film, talking about film, and wanting to make films. A period in which Jean-Luc Godard, the French right. filmmaker who, um, who really sets the, uh, the style for everything that comes uh, following, is having an enormous influence, Truffaut as well, of course. And uh, in Before the Revolution, Bertolucci is really trying out for himself a variety of things that the French had been doing. Um, uh, formally, stylistically, the film is almost a textbook. I mean, it could yeah. be taught as a student's textbook on various ways to cut various options in shooting a scene, various ways to break rules. At the same time, uh, contextually, it's involved very much with what would be a sort of obsessive theme with Bertolucci or themes. Right. Um, the interaction and the tension between politics and uh, psychology, the marriage of Freud and Marx, or the divorce of Freud and, and Marx, this kind of relationship that European intellectuals have been battling with for many years and which uh, Bertolucci takes very seriously. Yeah. He was, I don't know if he still is, but he certainly was for many years a member of the Communist Party and in fact did work for them, made an election film for them just before Last Tango, in fact. You know, very much in the Italian mode, of a communist, which means it's all right to be middle class, um, it's all right to be an intellectual, and it's all right to think and do a lot of things. And perhaps the only imperative is that you think about what you're doing right. and thinking. And so, indeed, contextually, before the revolution is full of that angst and anxiety, that tension between what the person feels, what the person intellectually knows is right. Um, well, that brings up, that sort of brings us around to some of these questions of self-referentiality yes. uh, in, in the film. That's one of the things that, well, that, that's even um, uh, encoded, shall we say, in the title of this book you're working on, right. Ballet of Strange Loops. <laughs> things keep coming back on top right. of, them, of themselves. How do you, th how do you think uh, this self-reflexivity works in, um, in, this, in this film? What aspects? Well, uh, in addition to uh, problematizing the narrative, which begins from the very start, um, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that start, if you don't. <laughs> the opening shots, the, the kind of uh, stream of consciousness of uh, the protagonist as he runs uh, to find Clelia in a church, all right, uh, to become finally uh, a bourgeois priest, uh, or at least uh, to enact uh, that scenario, the very scenario that he'll have to reject at one point and then finally uh, return to. Remember that uh, Freud. Uh, defeats Marx, uh, <laughs> at least, or at least uh, the Freud that takes the form of uh, nostalgia. Well, and except that Cesare endures and is one of the few characters who isn't totally boring or, or well, crazy by the end of the film. And he en endures a, as a cut right. in, in, into the great consummation of the bourgeois, right. bourgeois marriage, right. a cut who uh, cites Moby Dick and, right. uh, and the possibilities of uh, ultimate adventure, ultimate danger, which is th one of the great thematics of, of, of Bertolucci. Uh, the danger, the promise of danger, right. uh, usually through um, either dangerous politics, anti-bourgeois leftist politics, or uh, the, the personal equivalent of uh, that danger, which is amorous, erotic danger. Uh, but we've got to get back to uh, the metatextual uh, aspects, yeah. the scenes of, 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 of reading in the film, the, scene, the allegories of, uh, of viewing the film, which are many. There's the one that we talked about uh, uh, before, 
um, which you didn't particularly like, the one that's in color. Okay, no, yeah, yeah that, we, should we should explain that. We should explain that. The, the, first of all, in the print, unfortunately, we have the best print of this film we could come up with mm -hmm. in America for these purposes, which should lead us to some reflections about what kind of archiving perhaps we should be doing of world cinema, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very happy to, to have this print because it means we have a print and the, mm -hmm. the film is not lost. Nonetheless, we do have that sequence that I think some of our viewers may have noticed. Mm -hmm that is supposed to be not a full color sequence, is a, mm -hmm. is a sepia toned or muted tone sequence. Unfortunately, it's a bit, it's a bit more muted now than it was um, no, in uh, fact, originally. In fact, it is in the before fading in full color. I mean, it's full color as you could have aff afforded, but... Uh, and it's fairly gaudy, though. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, it's, but it's just progressively faded out over the years in the, in the few remaining prints. Yeah, but let's... Let's talk about well, that sequence. It would be one of the scenes uh, about viewing the film. It's one of the, uh, the places where um, uh, the problem of, uh, of viewing of, of, the view of the spectator's uh, processing of the film uh, becomes foregrounded, becomes a theme almost. And of course, it's in this elaborate uh, camera obscura, uh, optical uh, or, or mirror room, uh, somewhere in a tower in Palma. The tower has all kinds of uh, Stendhalian uh, references right. Uh, right. too, and of course it, it is the place of uh, the dangerous ant, the uh, dangerously erotic <laughs> ant, and uh, where she enacts the scenario of seeing uh, uh, and um, seeing um, more or less through um, absence almost right. um, uh, her ne her nephew, and so uh, it raises the That's whole problem. This earlier the scene where she keeps trying on different pairs of glasses yes. in a series of jump cuts. The film is, as you say, very much about how to see if how to see the world cinematically, not so much how to see a film, but how to see the world filmically. Yeah. Well, it, it, let, let me interrupt you, Bob, about that scene with the glasses, because I think um, we can squeeze the limit a little bit more about that, uh, about that one, because he is looking over at her. Mm -hmm. It is a moment of potential erotic revelation. I mean, it's the, the, his notions of who she is, how his feelings towards her is, is changing. But what's really interesting to me about that uh, that moment is, t to me, and maybe it is too, is to me it's not clear whether she is trying on all of these glasses or whether this is him imagining her in how she would look with all of these different pairs of glasses. That, that normal way in which we know whether an action is hallucinatory, a kind of uh, vision of his, or whether or not it's a, a quirky, fun-filled moment, you know, like something out of uh, A Hard Day's Night, something like that, where we think, in there, we know the Beatles are doing, mm -hmm. you know, something, and it may be wacky or whatever. Wh wh do you agree about that ambivalence I, in that I, moment? I don't think it's fantasy. I, in fact, I don't think it's really possible to deal with the film on ordinary conventional right, cinematic yes, no. notions right, of okay. fantasy. Yeah. Because even more interesting, mm. but preparing for that, is yeah. the meeting, the first meeting of Fabrizio and Agostino. Absolutely. When Fabrizio is going to right. Cesare's house, mm. they greet, he says, I have to go in, goodbye, don't forget to see Red River. Mm. And there's a cut, but it's not into Cesare's house or to Fabrizio. It's to them meeting again. And this happens, I think, right. yet a third time. It's a kind of slippage that takes right. place. And therefore, the same thing. In fact, I think um, that the same music is played, or a similar uh, music is played. So you understand that Agostino, in his role, I is being passed somehow uh, to the ant. And uh, in fact, the routine that she does corresponds in some way to the gorgeous uh, dance of the bicycle right. Right. that oh, we do and don't see, right. uh, which is, uh, again, another example of uh, one of the scenes of uh, seeing. Again, that is uh, um, metacidematic uh, in, in a very specific way. Well, then, uh, just to follow from what both of you have been saying, and I, I happen to agree about it, this is a film that doesn't pose these questions exactly of decidability. The way I it's was not Antonionian. That's, it's yeah, not that's the point. in that sense. Well, that, that's exactly what I, was what I was really going after, is that that would be the way of formulating initially, but this film, mm. and the word you use, Pele, is, is slippage. It slides among these. Undecidability is modernist. Uh, this slippage is postmodernist, in a sense, <laughs> and there's this, uh, <laughs> this postmodernist, we're calling it retrospectively, uh, uh, that's at work in, uh, in Bertolucci's, particularly in the, 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 the whole question of the pastiche, right. all the assemblage of these different styles, all in the way in which the, uh, the, the metacinematic uh, uh, elements work it's from like the start. To use a 
a very current uh, analogy. You sit down at a computer, uh, at a you know, sort of desktop publishing thing, and you just try out. You, know, you pull in the various things to see how they look together. Right. And I think that's exactly what Bertolucci is doing, just but you, seeing what can be done. You don't erase them. Right, keep, that's the difference. Keep them he kept them all. Keep right. the three and, 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 and for unfortunately, sometimes they work in the film, and sometimes I think they do not, because uh, there are moments where he gets lost, particularly, I think, in the, um, at those points where he can't escape the melodrama of the romantic relationship, right. the, the dangerous, as you said, which is nice, the incestuous mm -hmm. relationship. And there are points where the film seems, again, to slip, but this time to slip into a sort of, sort of ordinary reverie on, uh, on sexuality and, uh, and transgression. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he'll pull out and he'll, you know, he'll realize that he's getting caught, so he'll pull out and he'll go through his, his notebook of allusions. So he'll have, right. have her sitting, Gina, sitting on the bed, putting out photographs like uh, her counterpart in last year at Marion mm -hmm. Bond, uh, and, and on and on. So there are moments when the film gets very serious with itself, mm -hmm. and then moments when it again pulls back and, and uh, enjoys sort of playing around mm -hmm. And, uh, and back and forth until I think the grand climax at the opera where suddenly we're hearing and seeing you know, something very special, something that Bertolucci is hooking onto that will serve him pretty much for the rest of his career. Mm -hmm. And that's this Verdian. The uh, Verdian, and, and you know. the, way of, the way in which mm -hmm. he sees Italy through Verdi as the key reference point, which is not, uh, I mean, which is not an endorsement no. of the Verdian myth, mythos of Italian uh, culture, but a contemplation on it. It's also a way for him to do melodrama without being responsible for it, mm -hmm. for, uh, for allowing the opera to provide the melodrama for the film and indeed for those who know. Uh, this is about the most inside joke you can play because oh. it's never translated in, in, uh, in English language prints, the, right. the mm -hmm. operas. Uh, and so it takes, you either have to be uh, as passionate about Verdi as Bertolucci As an is, Italian. Or, or an, an Italian. Italian. In, uh, right? But indeed, yes, he's looking at, at Italy through this mm -hmm. magnifying lens of passion. You know, these, these great heavings of, uh, of, of, uh, of sentiment, of sensibility that, mm -hmm. that Verdi represents. And in a way, mm -hmm. the characters become both diminished and heightened by it. Mm -hmm. Particularly yeah. here, and this is the first time he does it. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's let's just work with that just for a second because since much of our audience did not have the advantage <laughs> uh because in this print it's not trans it, it's not translated. Um why don't you rehearse for us as it were what what's going on there with the, with the op at the opera and in the opera. Something you write about very well in the book. In the, in the in the narration proper this is the gathering place of of all of the borghese, all mm -hmm. of the the upper middle class of uh of Parma. And here is an opera about great, of the, uh, Macbeth, sorry, about great uh, uh, heroic and, uh, and romantic doings, and this is pinpointed against. Mm -hmm. Someone in the opera will sing a great greeting and will have a point of view shot of Gina seeing Fabrizio up in his <laughs> box next to, next to Clelia, or um, uh, Gina and Fabrizio will run through the halls as Lady Macbeth is singing her welcome to the feast just before the big revelation with, with Banquo's ghost. So you know the opera, you know that terrible things are about to happen. Mm -hmm. And in the film, certainly the indication is terrible things are going to happen to this poor fellow who mm -hmm. simply can't make up his mind between moral, political, traditional, right. <laughs> family, and religious obligations. Mm -hmm. So it plays back and forth, and the, and the opera kind of goes its own way. Mm -hmm. The narrative falters, falters in the sense that the characters can't, don't know where they're going, right. can't uh, consummate their passion the way a Verdian uh, heroine or hero right. He doesn't have a story in the way in which Verdi has a story. I mean, doesn't have the permission that, that Verdi has to express enormous amounts of feeling and have people take it seriously. Yeah. He has to uh, enter the box of, uh, of his uh, bourgeois uh, wife-to-be, the, in uh, the intended. And the uh, entrapment then in the, um, the Italian uh, diminished world of opera or whatever. Yeah. But it's also interesting to think of um, the previous uh, uh, scene with Puck, that whole um, oh, yes, oration yes. Uh, as, a, as, as a kind of um, 
another version or proto version of the uh, the, the entrapment uh, in the bourgeois opera house, which is what Italian marriages are, <laughs> uh, tend to be. Uh, but uh, the, the, that's an extraordinary um, also uh, piece because uh, if you're in a, uh, if you're familiar with Italian literature, you will recognize the subtext when he says farewell, addio, mm. uh, to the landscape, which is going to be. Uh, uh, capitalized uh, and uh, um, imminently. Um, Don't you he, see a mall there now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm Actually, it's industrial farming, probably. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. uh, is what. Uh, uh, in any case, what, what, you, what you have is this um, gorgeous um, uh, allusion to uh, Manzoni and okay. a, a goodbye to the mountains, which is a, a, a very uh, uh, operatic, as it were, a, a farewell to the uh, to the landscape. Uh, so so. Um, it, but, that, but I think he gets away with it uh, there because um, he finds a visual equivalent uh, for, um, you know, uh, the drive of the opera, that incredible, the shots of that uh, incredibly atmospheric place, that vague place, the Estango right. Lombardo. Right. Uh, yes, it's, it's fascinating that he never, until La Luna, which is relatively late, actually shows an opera. An opera is always there, an opera is always in the background. People mm -hmm. are breaking into arias from Verdi characters mm -hmm. in his right. films. Uh, in spite of stratagem, Rigoletto provides a sort of narrative foundation, mm -hmm. but we never actually see opera performed. And another interesting thing about the Poe the, the po sequence is this working out some another element that's going to be an important influence, mm -hmm. which is painting. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Indeed, there is a painter, an actual right. painter mm -hmm. there doing the landscape. And Bertolucci thinks a lot about painting, had mm -hmm. training in art history, in fact and begins to merge painting into his own style. So in spite of mm -hmm. stratagem, uh, the influence of Magritte, is wow. the, the Belgian surrealist, is enormous. Plus he uses the ligabue, I think. As the, the ligabue uh, at the beginning. The way he used the bacon in last time. And in bacon, of course, it provides literally oh. the compositional uh, strategy of the film. I mean, he sets up shots in last mm -hmm. tango that look like bacon paintings. Wow. Plus the color, the, yes. the use of. But it's much different than, say, um, uh, Pasolini's yes. uh, use, where, in other words, Piero della Francesca's will frame themselves uh, at certain points in the, uh, you know, in the unfolding of the film. Here, it's a, it's a real translation of cinema. Yes. Yes. Well, into when I think of that, uh, of the uh, Po Valley, the Puck sequence, because the character named, named Puck, it, that's a sequence that, that begins in an almost traditional manner, because he does, we have this, we have this establishing, we have a, a long shot that shows mm -hmm. us this, this group of people. But what's interesting to me about that is when, if an, uh, um, an American director used that shot, it would just be to sh set that up and then to get into the action. Mm -hmm. But with Bertolucci, as you've been talking about, there's always this other twist. So mm -hmm. it is a, a magnificently painterly shot mm -hmm. that has within it a painter. So we come back to this self-referentiality, mm -hmm. this inspection of the, mm -hmm. of the codes mm -hmm. uh, that are used to manufacture the text, text itself. So transgression, uh, and a gorgeous transgression, because uh, it is, as you say, an aria. It's an incredible release um, yeah. that uh, an American director also would not allow, uh, I think, that excess of, uh, of emotion that the Puck uh, character right. is allowed to deliver. But again, it's in quotations. It's ironic. It's like the use of the Verdi. In other words, the, the opera is always, uh, the, the operatic aria right. is always marked off. So Bertolucci somehow protects himself. Uh, in that kind of yeah, in no. that kind of way. The same thing, the same complicated uh, uh, citational structure, and uh, uh, is is at work in that um, scene of climax with Cesare, mm. and uh, yes. that <laughs> I think is the high point. That me. is the high point. It's the master, you know. But that too is is played as a duet, mm -hmm. uh, right? In which the two characters are interchanging mm -hmm. and, and 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 the extras of the uh, communist of the, party, the Unita Parade, right? <laughs> the, the communist party paper, which is. Sponsoring this, uh, and the ultimate extra, Marilyn Monroe. Right, uh, oh, okay. Marilyn Monroe <laughs> oh. is dead. It's yes, the year. Yes. It's the moment of her death, <laughs> and it very consciously, Bertolucci is setting the film two years earlier than it was what? made. I think to to deal mm. with that aspect, because what what Fabrizio can't do, obviously, is understand that a political commitment can encompass a whole range mm -hmm. right, of things, and that uh, for an Italian worker, Italian worker to feel about Marilyn Monroe's death is for him something of a diversion, something indicating that the workers are not pure, can't... Uh, right. And Cesare tries to straighten this out, and it's mm. impossible. I mean, he... Uh, 
what? Fabrizio is so much caught up. In because I think then the Freudian subtext, the whole notion of the hero has to in somehow de oedipalize himself. Mm -hmm. And revolution and the pose of revolution is uh, simply one of the instruments of de oedipalization. Uh, of course, uh, uh, as in all Bertolucci films, or most uh, Bertolucci films, re oedipalization re occurs. Uh, the father um, always wins, uh, the, the law of the father, uh, the regime of the yeah, bourgeoisie absolutely. of the church. Cesare escapes his intellectual father only to fall victim to the, the father of the, the ruling body of the middle class and the church and the opera house. The absent father. The, absent <laughs> father. <laughs> <laughs> the father who falls asleep while... <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk, you know, this is, uh, we've talked mm -hmm. about the painterly aspect, we've talked about this in the context. Uh, I, to us, I mean, this film is 20, almost 25 mm -hmm. years, uh, 25 years old, yet there is a visual, not that it, it, it always worked, but there's a visual inventiveness mm -hmm. uh, in this film, in its editing, in its framing, in its camera, camera movement. Uh, I think it would be interesting if we, we, Talk a little bit about that, because I mean, it mm. is it is a film that uh, I think you have a sense when you're watching it. Mm. You can't go away from this from this film. Uh, Truffaut once said of his films that he uh, always liked to include uh, a seventh inning stretch in them, so that <laughs> there'd be enough redundancy of information mm. or whatever that if you went away to get your popcorn or whatever. This is a film in which he's Bertolucci is almost manically e excited mm -hmm. about his technique and what he's wh what he's what he's dealing with. I mean, how does this strike uh, you, Pele? S some of the, this inventiveness and well, uh, it, it's a way of setting into crisis a traditional cinema, and it's part of the larger enterprise of um, of, of modernist post 1958 uh, uh, cinema. Uh, of course. Um, one of the things to do is um, talk about the uh, political aspects of, um, of such a setting into crisis of the traditional language of uh, cinema. I don't know if you would be willing to make uh, homologues the way uh, some critics do, but uh, I think that has to be considered. Uh, yeah. In other words, the fact that um, by um, fooling with the laws, violating, tra transgression, trans transgressing, but not uh, uh, in an absolute way, I'd right. say. Yes. There is, uh, uh, Bertolucci still remains a cinema of pleasure. Uh, right. or, uh, and not a cinema bliss of negative pleasure, say, in a Godardian sense or an Antonionian sense. I think there is uh, the, the, the kind of um, um, pleasure that comes in those uh, uh, scenes of excess, yeah. uh, although they, again, are... Yeah. He tries, in fact, in the next film, in Partner, to do right. a Godardian film of intellectual excess, yes. and it fails miserably. Absolutely. He can't do it. There's nothing wrong with pleasure, by the way. No, no, no. Especially, no, no, especially no. in a <laughs> film in which uh, the, the bourgeoisie will re, uh, will, the position will tr uh, triumph. Right, right. Uh, the that, uh, that notion of pleasure in that scene, in the park bench scene, where, yes. where Cesare and, and Fabrizio are talking, where instead of obeying the 180-degree the rule of classic mm -hmm. cinema, that you have your two characters and you shoot mm -hmm. either that way or that way, as if there were a line over which the camera may not move, mm -hmm. And he keeps moving it. He keeps cutting Absolutely. to the other mm -hmm. side so that they seem to flip over in their mm -hmm. position. And then he begins tracking the camera between the two of them. These are elements of excess which indeed are political because mm -hmm. the whole movement of that cinema, that movement that said that institutional cinema needs revision, needs overthrowing perhaps, was a revolutionary comment. And of course you're not going to be uh, captivated by the illusion of uh, cinema, which is profoundly political, the bourgeois, right. yes. Oedipal mm -hmm. uh, force, uh, forces that work in cinema. You'll always be aware that it is cinema, that it is um, uh, that there are limits uh, to the fact of, of, of what uh, uh, cinema can show and do, and so yeah, this, there's a that uh, that I think maybe we can uh, talk about the beginning uh, scene, which is so gorgeous. Yeah. I felt uh, I don't know if gorgeous is the word, uh, but the, the, uh, it begins more or less, I think, as a stream of consciousness. Yes. The poem that he's right. um, uh, reciting, of course, is uh, Pasolini's uh, religion, religione del mio tempo religion of my time, and it's a, a fierce indictment of uh, the, the, the Christianity as bourgeois project. And uh, of course, as he's running, and uh, everything is done in a rather uh, uh, jumpy way, um, he's running to his bourgeois destiny, <laughs> <laughs> or at least to the bourgeois right. destiny he's going to relinquish. But of course, it is the nature of bourgeois de destinies that what you relinquish becomes uh, your yes. destiny, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And Agostino, who knows exactly what's happening to his friend, opens the door and gives a low bow, welcoming <laughs> in him into that destiny, indeed. Yeah, that's, uh, well, one of the things I find interesting about that sequence is not only do we, it's unusual to begin a film with somebody citing a poem, 
Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, there's all kinds of, uh, there's a temporal confusion. I mean, where mm -hmm. is he when he's doing this? He's not located exactly mm -hmm. in time. I mean, it's resolved at the end of the sequence, but we're mm -hmm. held, that's held in abeyance. And then there's this, this mixing of spatial positions, mm -hmm. which is certainly anti-classical, because we begin with him moving along, then we cut to the mm -hmm. shot of him running. Right. And we don't know which is the, the true location. And then as he speaks of this place and of this city, we go to the aerial view. Uh, that, that we should say one thing about the theme of Parma, the theme of the city. I think that, that the subtext for that is, is Rossellini, Viaggio in Italia, at least in part. The whole business of the interrogation of, of, of Parma as a claustrophobic space and also as a, uh, you know, a, a, as a particularly um, northern Italian uh, landscape uh, uh, goes back to the um, Viaggio in Italia, which in some sense was the great founding film yes. for uh, In fact, there's a direct Nouvelle quotation Valley. in the cathedral uh, uh, when the camera sort of dollies mm -hmm. around the statues, uh, which is uh, directly imitating a sequence in Voyage to Italy. Absolutely. It's also interesting to think of the, uh, the erotic implications of, of that shot in the church when we first to see the bourgeois Madonna. Right. And As uh, if she were one of the, uh, the statues. Yeah, and, and the whole question of cutting, yeah. where, where the cinema that oh, flows yes. or jumps, you see, uh, that, then it is uh, anti-bourgeois, county-bourgeois. When it is static, the cinema is bourgeois. I'm, I'm, I'm no, thinking no, no. in Bertolucci's terms. And so there, the cinema becomes very static. And whenever she's filmed, uh, like she's filmed yes. uh, iconically, yeah. statically, yeah. Uh, bourgeois cinema. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which insists it, that we be located in place. Absolutely. Counter yes, cinema exactly. says the place right. is the screen and anything can be there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I think actually we've got to end at this point, you know, with this. It's a good, good line to end <laughs> on that, that, that the, the, in Bertolucci, the place is uh, the screen. If you'd like to know more about this place, that is Cinema Then, Cinema Now, this film series, or about cinema studies, graduate or undergraduate, at the College of Staten Island, drop us a line. Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, The College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop that card or letter, whatever you want, to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, The College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Well, Pele, it was great having you back on the show again, bringing your expertise about things modernist, postmodernist, Italian, and around, around the town. Thank Bob, you. it was a pleasure having you, and we look forward to having you next week when you'll also be here for our discussion of uh, the spider's, spider's stratagem. Good. In the meantime, I hope that our dis discussion here leads you to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. Bye-bye, and thanks for joining us. Well, it's really fun.